So about a year and a half ago, I was standing somewhere right about here, visiting with tailors and just considering the work, and you were considering me. And on Sunday afternoon, we had a, a little period of question and answer. And one of the questions that came up was one that I wasn't particularly expecting, though you never know what to expect in such a situation. But someone asked, what is your favorite Old Testament book? Well, I had to think for a minute because, you know, I've never really just had a favorite, favorite book. If you ask me today and I give you an answer, tomorrow you ask, it might be a different answer that I give you. It just kind of changes. But I thought, well, that's not going to be a good answer. And so I said, I said, well, I said, there's two books I really like reading through in the Old Testament. That's Exodus and Deuteronomy. And I could tell that Sister Mosley was a little, little saddened. <laughs> and she kind of, I could, she tried to not show it, but she kind of went, oh. Because I'm sure she was expecting me to say Ezekiel or Jeremiah, one of those prophets that, that she knows so well. Or Isaiah, Isaiah, of course, Isaiah, we can't forget Isaiah. But no, I said Exodus and Deuteronomy. Well, I still got asked to come and work with the church here, even though I got the answer wrong. But here we are in Deuteronomy, which is a book that I, I like. Because, uh, I, I don't know, I, I guess because of its practicality. I mean, here it was written to the children of Israel so many generations ago. And yet there's so much that we can learn from the book in, in so far as who is God and his character, his nature. And what does he expect of those who would be his children, those who would be his people? Oh, I know it's, it's a different law. It's a different time. But the basic requirements of being a peop the people of God is the same. That is, we have to hear him and we have we have to listen. We have to obey what he says. And even if we do our best to obey, we still have no hope were it not for God's grace. And all of those things kind of stand out to me in the book of, of Deuteronomy. You know, we can see in the early pages of this letter, this book, the love of God for his people becomes so evident and the love that Moses has for these people. These people who in so many ways have been a disappointment and so frustrating to Moses, if we can even imagine being in the place and the position of Moses, as he has tried so very much to lead these people and who have frustrated him at times to a point where he has done some things that he shouldn't do. No excuse being made, but if we can just imagine his frustration at times. And so here he is as the spokesman of God, and he has a lot to say because his time, his days are, are numbered now. They've made it again here. They're, they're at the, the banks of the river. They're looking across at the promised land that they have been working toward for, for 40 years. And Moses is not going in. His time with them now is limited. God has said that he's not going to because, because of the sin of Moses. He's, he's not going in. And so it's like he has so much to say to them in these final days. Now, by and large, what he has to say is nothing new. That's, that's the other thing about Deuteronomy. It's like we're not plowing any new ground here. I mean, what he has to say is things that he's already said or, or events that have already taken place. And now, on one hand, I'm thinking the children of Israel are, are thinking when he says certain things, they're going, like, yeah, yeah, we know that. We, we were there. And yet Moses sees the need of reminding them. And so here we are, some of us for how many times have we read through the book of Deuteronomy? You're reading the same thing. The words haven't changed. The stories are all the same. And yet we're looking for what we can take away from the book. And I think there's some really good things that we can take away from the book of Deuteronomy. Like I said, we're not plowing any new ground. It's all stories that we know and that we have, we've heard before. But imagine what's going through the mind of Moses. As he has so much to share with them. You know, I've, I've used the analogy before. This isn't as true as much today, I think. You know, we, with 
social media and cell phones, we talk with, with friends and kinfolk on a much more frequent basis probably than what happened 30 or 40 years ago. I remember when relatives would come from out of town and spend a couple of days and you haven't seen them for two years and, and, there's, and my parents would just be talk, 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 stay at two o'clock in the morning, talk, 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 like they've never seen them before. Well, it was almost that way. And then when it got time for them to leave, you'd walk them out to the car and you talk some more around the car. You know what I'm talking about. And you get in the car, they roll the window. Oh, one, one more thing. Let me tell you one more thing before you go. That's kind of what I think about with Moses. It's like, there's one more thing I've got to remember this. And that's kind of how I see this book. And so one of the questions, first question on the outline was with this in view. I mean, what was he thinking about? Would you tell me, that, what, what do you think is going through the mind of, of Moses? What else can we say about why he's writing this letter, this book? What would you say? Can I ask another question before you? Is it about Isaiah? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Are they like 19, around 20 and under? Is that the group that's going in? The group, so, so like those who are 20 and over died in the wilderness. So there are those who were like under 20 years, 19 years old, who are not 19 years old now, who have 40 years on them. You know, they're in their 60s now or more, up to 80, because 40 years have passed. Probably oh, 60 years on them. Yeah, 58. Yeah, yeah, like 58 and older. You know, and so and so it's like there, there is the there is that generation who were like some of our young people here who remember what happened. They almost went in the promised land. The spies came back, said, Oh no, we can't do it, we can't do it, except Joshua and Caleb, who said we should go. You know, God will be with us. And so there is the oldest now of the group that's about to enter in. And they're not all that old. Who remember the generation before. And so you have those then who are younger than that, you know, 40 years and, 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 and such and younger, who they've heard the stories. You know, they've heard from their parents. Well, we almost entered into the land, but your grandfather didn't have faith. Well, you know, they, they, they didn't go, you know, and, uh, and so they've heard the stories. And so it's interesting that there is the oldest of the group. You know, they were there. They were almost ready to, they were there. Of course, they were just young. And so they can tell the stories, but soon they're not going to be anymore. Yes. Yes, that's what I would understand. And over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they died in the wilderness. That whole generation, 20 years and older, died in the wilderness. And so, and of course, those who were there who remember that, they saw all of those die. So they, re, so they see, they, they've got something to remember. And they have something to tell their children, which is going to be part of what Moses is saying. Teach this to your children, to your children's children, so that they'll know. You know, in, in chapter 6 in particular, the, the emphasis is, is on that. You know, to listen to God, tell this to your children. So what else is on the mind of Moses? What's he thinking? Uh, there is no doubt. Uh, hold on. Go ahead, Calvin, then Ronnie. There's no doubt that Moses loved the people, and that's what makes him such a remarkable man. Yeah. Because of how rebellious they had been. Yeah. And he still loved them, but he was highly skeptical mm -hmm. of them. Telling you, not long after that, when he's gone, 
Joshua is addressing the people, and they tell Joshua, "We will, just like we did everything Moses told us to do. Yeah, right. We'll do everything you tell us. To do. Right. They lied. About yeah. It. Moses had been turning in his grave. Mm-hmm. He was highly skeptical. Of mm-hmm. their, yeah, their yeah. They they promised again, "We we will do we will do everything that God says, just like they said that to God in Exodus 19." You know, they said, you know, told Moses to tell to tell Father that we will do everything that he said. Well, they didn't. I mean, it was just a few days later they built a golden calf. You know, so it, Moses knows something about the history of these people, Ronnie. Right? Well, I just said how to keep them faithful. Yeah, that's right. That's. Can you imagine Moses is is, is trying to think? You know, what can I say? You know, any differently that's going to just capture the attention of these people and 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 encourage and spur their faith on. You know, to be all they should be. What is it? Yeah. Teaching is the only way we have to yeah. communicate and to try to encourage faithfulness in ourselves and in others. Mm-hmm. So he is teaching. That's why we see in that very first line of chapter four, listen. That's right. That's right. Listen. And, which becomes a repeated point, but he'll say that over and again. Yeah. Frustration struck the rock. What could have been that? That's right. One thing yeah. changed the rest of yeah. his life. And it, it did. It, it did. I, you have to wonder was that going through his mind? If I had just not done that, if I had not struck the rock, if I had given God the glory, you know, how that could have been different. And he even said that to them mm-hmm. about the because of you. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's I, right. I, I said, I, you know, I couldn't help but think that, you know, in some ways, you know, he's happy. For them. I mean, that, that they're finally going to sure. go into the land that God promised. Mm-hmm. You know, but at the same time, thousands of them and others, is, he's concerned. He, he, he has reason to be concerned because he knows their history. He, he knows their propensity of, of walking away from God. Alan. I, I think it's interesting that. Jesus was approached by the Pharisees in Matthew 22, and they asked him, what is the, what's the greatest commandment? In other words, of all the things that you could tell us, mm-hmm. what is the most important thing mm-hmm. that you can tell us? Mm-hmm. And he quotes something from Deuteronomy. He does. So it Absolutely. Should, tell, it should tell us that there's important stuff in here. That's right. There, there's some lessons to be learned for us that are just as pertinent as it was to the children of Israel you know, so long ago. Yes, Yeah, that must be a standard because I did that too. So it's one of those things uh, from a preacher perspective. Once you've worked with a group mm-hmm. and you're teaching them, you you don't want all that time and effort and energy and the tears mm-hmm. to, to just disappear. Right. Once you walk out the door, there's so many yeah. things that you want them to remember. You want to feel like your time was was valuable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I almost. I see Moses says, hey, I'm about to leave and depart from you. And there's nothing more that I want than to be able to look back at this time and, and feel that you took everything that I right. said. And you're yeah, something he wants them to remember, you know, what was said. So all that work that he had done would be of, uh, of value. And so, you know, he's we, we talked to him about just his his hope. You know, for them, you know, that, you know, listen to my words, follow them, um, because this would be what is required. If we look at our text, you know, in chapter four, look at the way he starts in chapter four. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you, follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers is giving you. So as we get into chapter four, you know, Ben took us through chapters one, two, three last week. It was kind of a, a bigger you know, overview. And some people would look at chapter four as the beginning of, some would call it the first sermon. You know, chapter four through 12. You know, this was this is the first sermon that Moses delivers. Some would look at there being three you know, throughout the, the book. And, uh, and this is how he begins that. 
And his concerns, of course, are that they would that they would turn away. I mean, you, you keep reading here, you know, verse two, do not add to what I command you. Do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God uh, that, that I give you. Verse three, early in this sermon, here's where he goes. You saw with your own eyes what the Lord did at Baal Peor. The Lord your God destroyed from among you everyone who followed the Baal of Peor. But all of you who held fast to the Lord your God are still alive today. And so he is on one hand saying, listen, listen to me. Listen to the words that I have to say, because I know that you have the propensity to turn from them. And he reminds them of one of the most grievous instances that took place. 24,000 men died for worshiping the Baal of Peor, remember? And, and that's, that's right where Moses goes, remember this? There was no one who could say, no, I don't remember that. Of course they remembered that. It was, it was a huge incident. And so that's where Moses went with that. And so if we think about then, and, and in the big picture of application, what we have to do is in some way put ourselves in the place of these people and, and think about what they were hoping for, you know, with regard to entering the land. They were hopeful for uh, success. And yet there must have still been some apprehension. I mean, like, what can go wrong with this? They're, they're entering into, you know, a foreign country with, with other people. And so, I mean, again, they sent spies in, two spies this time. And, but there seems to be a little different attitude, a little more confidence now. Not just in the spies, but with the people when the spies come back and say that we can we can take this this land. You know, one of the questions was, you know, what might be their concerns? You know, and, and, and he turned that around again. What what would be their concerns? How would you kind of sum that up? What are their concerns? Concerns we probably have before. Yeah, I mean, I mean the. Human nature is going to say, this could not go well. You know, across the river, the Canaanites, they know we're coming. You know, they're, they're bound to be prepared. You know, there, there's a lot of people over there. And so there was, I'm sure there had to be some concern of, of failure. And entering the land would come with some challenges, mostly of their own doing. But there would be challenges for sure. Yes. I just said, in general, the, just the fear of the unknown. Yeah. Just not knowing. Sure. You know, just that I like that. Of self confidence. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, that we all experience. And many times when, you know, taking on some like a new job or whether to apply for a new position or, you know, whether to. Right. Whatever we do, it, you, just, you just don't know. See, there, there, there are a lot of ways where, where we can have some understanding of what their concerns were. You know, Jimmy's saying, you know, we, we're going into a new job and we have some concerns and, and uh, you know, about something like that. We're going to a new school. We're moving to a new area. There, there's concerns and apprehension that we have. It's part of just our, our nature, I guess. And so in some ways, I think we can relate to just what they were facing, some things that they were dealing with, just some of the personal concerns that, that they might have had. And, and you know, <clears throat> going into the land has proven to be a challenge before. Not on God's account, but on, on their own. It was due to the actions of, of Israel. And so we think back for a moment, you know, just, you know, <clears throat> the message that Israel had to have heard well and maybe needs to hear again uh, that they'd received 40 years earlier. You know, if we go back just for a moment, look back to Numbers chapter 13, and, and we're going back to, you know, the spies coming back from, from visiting the land, you know, some 40 years ago, Numbers chapter 13. And in, the, in verse 1, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites <clears throat> and each tribe sent men. And my point of emphasis on looking at that passage is just that very simple part where it says, explore the land that I'm giving to you, that I'm giving to the Israelites. I mean, that's what God told them 40 years prior. 
the land I'm giving to you. And they still came back and said, no, you know, we, we, we can't do it. And so when you think about that, still there in, in Numbers chapter, uh, in chapter 14, you know, what is the reason they missed the opportunity to enter the land? Verses 26 through 35 kind of, I think, sum that up. But verse 33 in particular, you know, <clears throat> your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lie in the desert. That's what God said to them for their failure, their lack of faith. And, and that's the point of emphasis. And you see, this is what Moses is trying to say. We go back to our text. This is what Moses is trying to remind them of. And why he, he's going to be reviewing so many instances that took place before and certainly during the, the 40 years in the wilderness. Where it was a lack of faith that got them into problem. So 40 years passed. God's grace is great and he has not forgotten Israel. I mean, when we look at it from a human standpoint and we look at Israel, how many of us and how many times would we have said to Israel, I'm through with you. I'm out of here. But God continued to lead, to help, to encourage, to give direction to them. And so a question, what lessons can we learn about God from those 40 years in the wilderness? What can we learn about God from those 40 years in the wilderness? What do you think? He keeps his promise. All right. He's faithful. And something Calvin said last week that I've thought about a couple times this week is, you know, he is faithful and we should trust in that. But I feel like as humans, we need that reminder and mm -hmm. that, hey, look at all the things. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to kind of look at our circumstance and think, oh my goodness, is this going to be the time that I'm here by myself without mm -hmm. God? Like we lose our focus. And I feel like it's a parallel and has been through history because right now I know I keep having to remind myself of his faithfulness. And sure. To approach what is 2021 going to be like? What is the new administration going to be like? What is this going to, or that, you know, like all those feelings that they probably were feeling on the cusp of this big change. Oh, yeah. I feel if, like we feel often and, you know. To, to, get, to get a better perspective here of just what's going through the minds of the children of Israel. We have to see the bigger picture of, of where they are at, not, not just where they're at, but where they have been and what they have gone through. And it helps us to think a little more clearly about the things that God is, is saying. I see another hand somewhere that I dream that. No, Jimmy, right, we'll, we'll come back here. I was just, one thing that kind of stuck out to me was that after he pronounced this death sentence on them, for the next 40 years, he still provided in here. Right. Yeah. Like he didn't turn his back on that them and say, okay, so you guys go wander by yourselves for 40 years and I'll come back mm -hmm. and then I'll start taking care of the ones once you've all died. Mm -hmm. He still provided. He still led. He still cared for. He still, you know, took care of them even though. Right. All, all the way through. Even in, even in their weaknesses. You know, God was still there. He was consistent, Jeff. What you hear is what you get. Mm -hmm. So he said, always. God hasn't moved. God's promises are steadfast. God hasn't moved. That's right. You know, and, and, and that's a good point. You know, it's easy for us to look at the promises of God and see promises fulfilled. And, and we talk about, about those things, but sometimes we just need to look at the discipline that comes from God, too. And Israel went through some very serious discipline, you know, through the years. Through those 40 years, there are many instances where God disciplined. He taught them. God is steadfast. Yeah. One of the things that I've been thinking about here is...
Moses, as the leader, led him through this period of 40 years and, and suffered with them through time after time of their rebellious nature and their disobedience mm -hmm. and the times of frustration. How many times did they sin? Mm -hmm. And then on that one occasion, he sinned. And he was the one that was prohibited from going in the land. Yeah. And here are all these people after the great rebellious nature and display for the past 40 years get to receive that blessing. And so that's an important lesson for us mm -hmm. in terms of accountability. Yeah. What God expects from those who are leaders. Yeah, exactly. I, I think this is another really important point. God's expectation of what Moses would do, what he would say, how he would handle himself. God held that in very high regard. The, the character of Moses is something that is just uh, interesting to me. It's an interesting study. Moses the meek, as he is called in, in scripture. And yet, meek in submission to God, but he's not weak. And Moses is not weak in any way to be doing what he's doing and to lead these people as he did. He's not weak. But meekness in the eyes of God. And God held Moses to a very, very high standard because he was to be an example to the people. And when Moses fell down, there were some serious consequences that Moses had to face and, and deal with. And he becomes an example even in what he did wrong and the punishment that he received, he becomes an example to the people, you know, because he was that leader that God had chosen for them. So you see, when we step back from it, you know, it's, it's not just about the children of Israel. It's about God. We, we can see, we can learn so much about God in these pages. I know we keep talking, but we focus on the children of Israel, their sins, the wilderness wanderings and the, the things they did right, the things they did wrong. Those are all powerful lessons. But over top of all of this is God's place in position and his character that as well stands out to us in, in this. Other thoughts or comments on that line? There. Yes. Um, at the end of chapter 27, he talked about the curses. Mm-hmm. Right. But the very next verse is chapter 28. If you fully obey the Lord and be careful to follow all of his commands, I just think this is so true for us. Absolutely. And, and this is the reoccurring term, uh, theme all the way through this, this book. You know, that, that God has delivered his word. Here is what he wants done. Here are his commands. And Moses is saying over and over again to them, Hear, O Israel, the words of your God. And, and we need to be listening to that. We, we see so much. We learn about the, the, the nature of man. We learn about the character and nature of God as we, we look through this. Okay, let's see. Let's go down to the heading that says God offers the key. I've been calling these three chapters here for a lesson title, you know, the... The key to the promised land. I think I'm changing it to the keys to the promised land because there's several things here. And, and I've tried to think of this analogy as Israel is standing at the river about to go in. And, and it's like, you know, Moses is saying, I've got the keys. I'm, a, I'm I, you know, I'm not going over. I'm going to hand these over to you. The, these are the keys of life that you need that is going to get you into the land. As I look through these three chapters, there are several things that stand out, and there's more than really what we're going to deal with, but grace, God's grace, obedience, and listening to God. And so here we are at this point where these 40 years have passed, and God offers them the key. And so Moses is once again delivering to them a message from God, and he does it in such a very passionate way. And uh, I guess on one hand, I've thought Moses had a lot of practice. 
at trying to talk to these people and to say something in such a way to hopefully capture their attention and, and make them listen to him. And so in, in some ways in this, you know, as a metaphorical kind of way, he's delivering a key. Here's, here's the code, so to speak, to not only guarantee entrance into the land, but to help them find prosperity in the land. And the key was pretty simple, really. We're back to that text in Deuteronomy 4. I'm going to read this first three verses again, first two verses. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and laws I'm about to teach you. Follow them so you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. What is the key to enter in and live in the land? What's verse 1 and 2 tell us? Say again. Yeah. To follow these words. I mean, here are the instructions. It's, it's, no, it's nothing hard. Plowing no new ground. This is old stuff. But somehow we need to really understand. And take these instructions to heart, you know, for our application right here. And the consequences. The consequences of, of not keeping the covenant. Did you look ahead there, verse 40, or, uh, 23 and 24? What are the consequences a failing to keep the covenant with God. What'd you put? What do you see? Hmm? Yeah. Jehovah God is a jealous God. He is going to accept nothing less than complete obedience. Complete submission. He will accept nothing less than that. Verse 23, be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. God demands our full attention and obedience. And if we think of it this way. Can that lock be changed? That is, can access to the land be taken away? What did he say? What did Moses say about it? Verses 25 and 26. If you disobey, God's going to discipline. You'll be destroyed. You know, it's, it's not hard to understand what God is saying here. And uh, powerful lessons. So, yes. One thing, four, five, and six, I really see in what he's doing is he personalizes this to these people. A lot. Mm -hmm. The word you is used throughout the a lot, obviously. But, you know, when he talks about uh, verse 9, keep your soul diligent. talks about if you disobey, he goes through that, the you, and then he says even further than that, the whole people and everything else. But the chapter 5, where it's uh, verse 3, it says, He did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us, with all of those of us alive, alive here today. But I think that's the big thing about this, is it, it, it is you, you, how do you take people that are 40 to 58 years old at this point, 59, that might have been 1 to 20 when these things were happening, and make this personal, not just to them, but everybody that's entered in as well. And, and we all need to remember that. That isn't this. We could talk about the weeds, what they did, they mm -hmm. disobeyed, they got scattered. Leviticus 26, if you do these things, which we all read about is that they did it, you know, they, yeah. they were just hearing about it for the first time. And yet we I sometimes read these things I think so, and, and think, oh, that's them, 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 them. But it, it's not, it's got to be personal. That's right. It's, it's a hard, it is. It's a hard thing to do, and he's trying to do that with them. And, and, and then where we have to take it and turn it around to us, there are personal points of application that we can make here, too. And, and, and you're right. This is a very impassioned plea of Moses to these people that he knows so well. He makes it personal. You know, he, he's, he's reminding them of things that they can go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Or our fathers told us about that. It was real to them. Sir. When it's a covenant, it's not just God said, I'm going to do all this stuff for you. Like, we have an end to hold up as well. If we don't right. obey, if we break the covenant, if we, like, 
like somebody said, he's steadfast, he's faithful, he's going to keep his end, whether that's the good thing mm-hmm. or the punishments, but we have a part in this covenant too. Sure, um, and, and, and this is where we see, we, we see God's grace extended to them over and over. And yet what is demanded of them, as you said, sir, obedience. Here's what you have. God has done. Every, God has laid this all out. God has prepared the way. What are you going to do about it? Hear, O Israel, keep the covenants of your father. And so that's, that's, that's our side of the deal, so to speak. Okay, so I knew we wouldn't get through this lesson. I really didn't intend to get through all of this lesson today. We're at that point now. We're going to spend a few minutes next week, Lord willing, Look at the last part of the lesson here, just about, do you see God's grace demonstrated in chapter four? No, you don't find the word grace, but you might just go through and you find three or four or five just phrases that maybe gives us some inclination of how God extended his grace. Jot those down, and we'll talk about that just a, a, a little bit. And, um, and then we'll be going into the next lesson, lesson number three, which is out in the foyer. Be sure you pick that up on the way. And our focus turns a little bit more to obedience. And God willing, we'll talk about that next week. Thank you so much for your good comments. Look forward to next week.